Hi, I'm Alan Katz. I'm Bloomberg's Paris Bureau Chief, and welcome to our panel on critical minerals and sustainability. For a century, oil companies developed a vast network to extract, refine, and deliver their product to customers around the world. Sourcing the materials needed to build an alternative, less carbon-intensive economy presents a whole new set of challenges. China has tackled these successfully for more than a decade, making it a leader in so-called critical minerals. And now the U.S. and Europe need to catch up. So what are critical minerals? About 50 metallic elements and minerals currently meet those criteria, mostly for their role in building the infrastructure required to reduce carbon emissions and because they're used in semiconductors. And some of them include lithium, cobalt, and nickel used in electric vehicle batteries, silicon and tin used in smart grids, rare earths that go into wind turbine magnets, copper for grids, wind farms, and other applications, and gallium and germanium for solar panels and defense radar, among other applications. While many of these critical minerals can be found in a raw state across the globe, extracting them and refining them can be costly, technically challenging, and polluting. China dominates the entire value chain in many of these products, accounting for more than half of the world's production of battery metals and close to 100% of rare earths. Even in less rarefied metals such as coppers, forecasts for massive demand growth have sparked a realization that there might not be enough to go around. This year, the European Union categorized copper and nickel as critical raw materials for the first time, and senators in the United States are looking to do the same for copper. So why is relying on China a problem for Western nations? Well, in general, overdependence on supplies from, supplies from any single country is something that manufacturers try to avoid because it leaves them too exposed to disruption. With China, there's also the sometimes difficult relationship with the U.S. to consider. In July, for example, China said it was imposing restrictions on exporting gallium and germanium, a move that's likely to raise cost for hardware manufacturers. So what are China's economic rivals doing about this? Well, the Inflation Reduction Act aims to help the U.S. meet its climate goals through investments in renewables and EVs and curb prices of raw materials needed for the climate transition. The European Union's Critical Raw Materials Act, launched in March, aims to ease financing and permitting for new mining and refining projects and strike trade alliances to reduce the bloc's dependence on Chinese suppliers. The U.S. and Europe are also looking to set up a buyer's club to strike supply deals and investment partnerships with producing nations. At a meeting of the Group of Seven Nations in April, ministers agreed to commit $13 billion to fund new mining projects. That, of course, begs the question of how is China responding? So Chinese companies look like they're set to consolidate their grip on some key metals, such as nickel and cobalt. In lithium, while the U.S. is building out supply networks with free trade partners such as Canada and Australia, China is consolidating its relationships with African nations. In rare earths, there are signs, signs that China may seek to slow the West's efforts to build new mining and processing capacity by restricting exports of key technology and equipment. So with that somewhat complicated and contentious picture, let me turn to our, our panelists that we have with us today. Uh, to my left right here, we have Jeff Streeton, Chief Development Officer at Aramet, which has world-class mining deposits in manganese, nickel, mineral sands, and lithium. Next year, Aramet will become Europe's leading producer of battery-grade lithium with a startup of production at the Centenario Ratona site in Argentina. And in Indonesia, it's working on the production of nickel and cobalt salts from the world's largest open pit nickel mine. Since you're also talking about sustainability, I should add that Aramet's ambition is to become a reference for the responsible transformation of the Earth's mineral resources. Next along uh, on our panel is Michael Staffas, the president and CEO of Bulliden, which is the leading base metal company in Europe, producing mainly copper, zinc, and nickel, and has operations from exploration and mining to smelting and recycling. It's specialized in producing metals with a low carbon footprint alongside a, song, alongside a strong safety culture. And finally, we have Rita Jo Lewis, the president and chair of the U.S. Export-Import Bank, the Export Credit Agency of the United States. It provides American businesses with the financing tools necessary to compete for global sales, but it does a lot more than that. And in the context of this panel, for example, the Exim Bank may be tapped to provide risk cover for critical minerals development in Australia, at least according to that country's resource minister, Madeleine King, who said that last month. And earlier this month at a conference in South Africa, Ms. Lewis said, quote, Exim is looking and interested in all types of projects, all sectors. So first of all, let me welcome all three of you. Uh, and starting with you, Ms. Lewis, so what do you see as the role for the Exim Bank in financing mining activities? And given uh, 
that there is so much demand, why do we need government funding for some of these projects? Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for that question. It's good to be able to be here to talk about these subjects, uh, this particular subject today. Um, the way we look at it at XM is when you look at us as America's um, export credit agency and, and we look at our mission, which is about sustaining jobs and facilitating exports, it's really about how we use our financing tools. How can we deploy the tools that we have to support U.S. business and foreign buyers who want to work with our, who want to purchase goods and services from the United States? You know, when you look at um, uh, the tools that we have, everything from direct loans or um, our guarantee program, our insurance program, we are trying to find any type of method financially that's mandated by Congress to allow us to use to help our companies to be more competitive. We want to make sure that they not only are out there competing, we need them to win. So if we have to, uh, we be, have been able to introduce new flexibilities uh, for them uh, so that when they're out there competing uh, against others, it helps us to help them level the playing field. Great. Thank, thank you. So, so, but one thing that, that I'm not sure was quite answered in that response is for, for mining in, in particular, again, there, there seems to be a lot of demand. Are there some, some market failures or something that sort of the Exim Bank really sees as, okay, this is why we have to be there to, to help these companies? Well, you know, you, you, it's all about um, looking at uh, Exim from a, from a perspective of uh, being there to support when you have the, those extra political risks or those uh, to be able to mitigate that risk. And so when people are coming to XM or when they come to government, you, you ask the question of why, why is government involved? At the end of the day, um, having been uh, a, a, a principal player uh, as a part of the discussion uh, with the mineral security partnership that was launched at the State Department where uh, U.S. brought together 14 economies uh, to work on these particular issues. They always are looking where is where is government going to intervene, and where is government? Does government have some tools to be able to assist in that? Because at the end of the day, these are all driven by private sector, and but government wants to be there to be able to step in where a commercial bank or a non-bank lender cannot. And we're not trying to take the place of the market. We're trying to make sure that we can be there as one of their partners uh, in the uh, securing of these different types of, of, of minerals. Great. Thank you. So turning to the private sector then. So, so both Michael Steppes and, and Jeff Streeton, um, I guess Michael first. Um, what do you think about the ability of mining companies like yours, but also talking about the industry more broadly, to meet this kind of demand that we've sort of laid out for these critical minerals? Well, first of all, of course, demand and supply always meets in this industry. It's just a question of the price. So the demand will have to adjust to whatever the supply is. Uh, it, it's, of course, difficult to know exactly what the, the demand will be. But if the demand is going to be as high as projected by many, it will be difficult for the mining industry in kind of any circumstance to be able to meet that for what I would call the normal base metals. I mean, there's lots of copper mines, lots of nickel mines, and lots of zinc mines that need to come into place. I think it's actually going to be easier in some of these areas that people talk a lot about, rare earth and lithium and so on, where it actually doesn't take that many mines and suddenly the world is oversupplied. Uh, you know, you could quickly turn around the position and, and you could actually see a big risk as an investor that the prices will tumble. So I think that collectively, yes, it depends what the demand situation in total will be. Uh, I am more scared about the base metals in that area than I am about these rare earths or about lithium as such. Uh, but it, there will be needed for projects everywhere. And of course, there needs to be a pipeline globally for these projects. Uh, and then, of course, you can add the geopolitical swing to this. Uh, that What I all said so far was all assuming that these things will flow across the world and trade. Uh, now, if that is not going to happen, I think there are certain areas who are in bigger issues than others, and Europe is one of those. Uh, if free trade in some way stops or gets limited, Europe will have a big problem. Jeff Studer? I think there's there's multiple dimensions to this. The there's the ability of the industry to respond is obviously driven by the geological endowment. You know, so what resources 
physically exist and can be uh, explored and found and and, uh, and 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 brought into production. But then there's the capacity of civil society to host the mining, uh, to host it sustainably, the capacity of the infrastructure that's needed to to support these projects, and and then obviously the financing development. And so all of these elements typically take time to resolve. I mean. Uh, Generally, a, 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 a large-scale mining project takes 10 to 15 years to bring into production from exploration. And so there's been a lot of social pressure in the recent years, this sort of almost panic response to critical metals. And the you know, industry is responding. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Mikhail's comments that they, they, it will vary in different commodities depending on the nature of the commodities. Some commodities are very deep and liquid with many producers and it will take a long time to materially change that. In other commodities, absolutely, one or two deposits might completely change the world supply demand balance and uh, respond quickly. So every commodity has different characteristics. Uh, every commodity has uh, different uh, impacts that in terms of its financing pathways, its, 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 its sustainability pathways that need to be addressed. And so it, it, it's, not impo it's not possible to give it one single critical minerals answer. It's going to vary uh, across all of these commodities. So, so one question, actually bringing that up, you mentioned so 10, 15 years to, to bring a mine to, uh, into operation and the, and the sustainability path, which is different for, for, for each mineral. But in terms of, I guess, sustainability, I, and, and turning to Bolidan first, um, what does modern mining look like for Bolidan? Your mines are, are all in Europe. Um, how do you factor in sustainability? How much does that affect your operations? Like how, how, can you sort of like lay it out for people who might not understand sort of how mining operates these days? Uh, well, well, thank you. I mean, it's, um, I, I often get this question, and I usually give one example. This is a little bit of a morbid example, but it shows a lot how mining has changed over the last years, which many people who haven't really ever been in touch with mining or has seen mining uh, way back uh, will not really have understood what has happened. And I'm taking now the, the example of fatalities in, in mining, which is one example, and that's one area of sustainability. We integrate all, lots of aspects in sustainability, but just to get a chance, a sense of it, Bulletin as a company in the 1960s had 38 fatalities over the 10 years. So close to four people died every year in our operations. If you go to the 1970s, that number was around 30. If you go to the 1980s, it was around 20. If you go to the 1990s, it was eight. If you go to the 20 teens, it was two. And if you go to the 20, well, the 20 zero zeros was, was two, and you go to the 20 teens, it was zero. So we've gone from 38 to zero. Uh, this is, of course, a development that is by one company, and I think that we are a little bit spearheading. If we would behave like the average large mining company of the big 26 in, that are members of ICMM, we would have had seven in the 20 teams. We had zero. But, of course, seven is much less than 38 anyway, and everybody has gone on this sustainability journey. Uh, and that's just an example of how mining has totally changed over the last 50 years, and many people have not seen that. Now, this is one example on, on occupational health. It's kind of easy to talk about. Uh, it's easy to people understand. But you can make the same argument about emissions to water, emissions to air. Um, you can make it about uh, almost any area of, of mining, and you'll get the same kind of development. Basically, we've gone to an area where we feel that on these areas we're doing very fine. Mining still has some areas that needs to be worked more upon. Uh, the climate change or the climate challenge is, of course, there for us. Uh, and here we have, you know, a way to go, even though we are very much part of the solution for everybody else to handle the energy transition. We're also part of the problem because we are emitting CO2. Uh, here, there's also been a lot of developments over time, but there's more that can be done. Uh, and then the last part of sustainability, which always has to be put into place, is biodiversity. Here, uh, you know, the m many more things can be done. We as a company have committed on biodiversity to be net positive in 2030. That's only seven years away. We have, on, we have committed to the um, science-based targets uh, for the mining operations on the CO2. Uh, so we are well underway to make what is already a very sustainable operations even more sustainable. 
Thanks. And now, now Bulletin's mines are all in Europe. Uh, what about for Aramet? It's a European company, a French company, but you have mines in Gabon, Senegal, as well as Indonesia and Argentina. Uh, how do you factor in sustainability into your operations? And again, how does it affect you? How does it affect those? How does it affect your output? How does it affect your pricing? Sure. So firstly, mining is a global industry. So you can't, you can't be a sustainable operator in an international industry and operate differently in different places. You have to apply the same values, the same principles wherever you operate. And that's certainly something that I, I find uh, most international mining companies are very strongly uh, aligned with uh, these days. So we apply the same, the same operating principles globally. It's not a, a European mindset uh, being different to how we operate in, uh, in other countries. So the issues that uh, Mikhail spoke to, we have to address wherever we are. The social dimension of community, I think, is the other dimension that needs to be uh, these days very addressed. So traditionally, I think mining was able to sort of argue that the economic value of the activity overrode potentially the sort of uh, the other, other concerns and that, that, that led to outcomes in, in, in the past where mines were imposed. These days, we have to be very much uh, operating in a way that makes our host communities want us. Uh, so that's a, that's the final the final element of the of the puzzle. So um, the other element, of course, is that being a global industry. It's also global capital, and so our capital providers expect us to operate in a consistent manner globally. So they're, they're, from that regard, there's no there's no substantive difference. So speaking of, of capital providers, so this is a question for for all three of you. Um, there's been, a, of course, a surge in ESG investing over the last several years. Um, some of them are, you know, as we discussed actually before this panel, are, are quite limited funds that, that really exclude mining. Some of them are, are more broad in, in the kinds of investments that they will allow. But how does that, the rise of ESG investing, affect the mining industry and its, in your ability to, to get funding? Um, are either of your companies able to tap into ESG funds? How does the Exim Bank work with ESG, with ESG funds in terms of trying to sort of get the capital to, to the right places? And I guess we'll start sure. down the panel. So, so it's, it's absolutely a factor. Um, now, there are different types of ESG-driven investments. So there are funds who are specifically ESG is at the heart of their sort of constitution, for want of a better word, and they can be often very selective in what industries they choose to invest. Then there's the more mainstream uh, capital market approach, which is really more about investing, but with an ESG awareness. Uh, and so certainly mainstream capital markets, uh, we see much, much higher ESG awareness than was traditionally the case. Uh, we have to put as a, as a company a lot of attention into to managing ESG rating in the same way that traditionally uh, commercial enterprises might manage their credit rating. It's exactly the same now that the, the, the sort of the effort and approach you have to go to. So we are we monitor we monitor that just as closely as we do financial rating uh, activity uh, because ultimately mainstream capital markets utilise those services to to assist them in 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 the investments they make in in where they choose to allocate capital um, and uh, we need to be ensuring that uh, our portfolio addresses the the needs of of those markets. Um, yes, there are. ESG specific funds that sometimes choose not to invest in mining as a as a matter of principle, um, but uh, really more within mainstream capital markets, it's not so much about whether or not it's changed our access to funding. It's more just simply we have to respond to it and address the needs that they uh, they have to demonstrate how uh, the capital that we deploy is used. And and for Bulletin, well, I would say that the main. What we see around this whole topic is lots of administration. There are many, you know, investment funds or other investment vehicles out there who all want to make sure that they do the right thing on ESG, whether they be specific ESG funds or whether they are, uh, you know, just regular funds but want to make sure that they have a good ESG conscious. This all means that everybody has their own kind of form that we should supposed to fill out. So it's, uh, you know, it's taking uh, quite a lot of administration and or maybe also feeding some consultants to making sure this, all this paperwork gets done. But otherwise, from our point of view, I don't think we have seen a single investor jump ship because they feel that ESG, that we, they cannot invest in us because of ESG. Nor have we really seen, although we've seen some maybe, but not really that we've seen the other way around, that there is money that is dedicated to ESG that is coming our way. I would say there's lots of money out there. Everybody's keen on ESG and it hasn't really affected the way that they invest in our case. 
I think from, from Exxon's perspective, um, when you look at 13 countries, now 14, that have come together to look at uh, supporting socially responsible projects, um, they all are looking at ESG uh, and have actually uh, announced the principles from ESG that they want to support. Uh, we all know that uh, we need to be great stewards of our environment, but where it all comes in is that you have countries who are coming together now to support projects, and that is just that's one of the principles that uh, the governments have um, uh, coalesced around. And I, I don't see that moving anytime soon. I think it's going to be, it's about international standards. And when you, as you said, when you start talking about working in communities, communities have an expectation. And that is one of them. And I think it's going to continue to grow. It puts, a, uh, it puts sometimes, it can be a challenge, but it is part of the due diligence of any project that we would be looking at at, at XM. I, I can just add a little bit on this one that, uh, you know, Europe doesn't really export that much in this area, but it does, it's pretty good at exporting regulation. Uh, and it comes in, in different shapes and forms. Uh, and I would say that, and, and it, you know, it happened with IFRS and the accounting principles and they went around the world. What is now happening with CSRD on the EU level, which is going to be the standardized European way of, of you know, reporting sustainability, I, I am actually pretty positive around that because I think at the end of the day, we're going to, get a big form to fill out and it's going to take some time and people are worried about that but there's so many other special reporting that we can scratch and I think in the end of the day we're going to be able to do the same you know no, nobody asks us to give any specifics around certain aspects of our financial reporting everybody will assume that once you have you know done that according to IFRS and you have an auditor signing off those are the right numbers uh, and I hope that we will get to the same place also when it comes to sustainability reporting because it has, especially during the last year, years, been a mess. And and how soon actually would you expect that to happen when you, when you say you hope it'll it'll go that way? Well, C CSRD, we are as European companies needing to report that for the full year of 24, i.e. we need to make sure that we collect the right numbers as of January, and it will be presented in the annual report for 24, which is published in early 25. Uh, and then you can argue how quickly it will be exported around the world so that other you know, countries will copy it for their own regulation. That I don't know, but I think it could go relatively fast. And so one of the other things that's come up, of course, is there have been a lot of trade disputes between the U.S. and China over the past few years, um, to, to a lesser extent, but also trade friction between the EU uh, and China. Has that affected uh, either the ability of the two of you uh, to either close deals or actually mine or operate in certain countries? And if so, which ones? And how have you overcome those issues? And the same thing for the Exxon Bank in terms of financing projects or, you know, you talked about the 14 countries in the, in the partnership. Are the countries that have sort of backed away as a result of some of the, of the disputes between the U.S. and, and China? But start with so, so, look, in, in my current uh, company at Aramech, no, it hasn't. In fact, we jointly invest with China. We have, uh, well, with Chinese companies. We have uh, jointly operated businesses and, and typically our approach there is in terms of access to product. Each partner takes their share and does what they choose to in terms of how they how and where they sell it. Um, in, in, as you may tell from my accent, I'm, I'm Australian. Uh, in my previous career in Australia, yes, I have experienced instances of direct trade uh, being halted through, through this type of action and uh, it's incredibly disruptive when it takes place in a globally traded commodity um, and it uh, leads to significant market dislocation and uh, and uh, economic hardship and uh, and takes years to resolve. Just one thing, if I can follow up quickly on Airbnb, and then we'll pass to, to Bolidan, but is for the, the two projects in Argentina and, and Indonesia that you have with a Chinese company, who negotiated the mining permits for this? Was it you? Was so it Chinese? In, in both those instances, they are projects that Aramet has developed uh, in terms of from over, and I spoke earlier at the time, you know, both instances we've spent 10 to 15 years developing these projects. And, uh, and then we have, uh, in, in, in previous years, we've brought in partners to, to assist with the actual uh, financing and operational stage of the development, and uh, but that's worked very smoothly. But uh, we um, we find uh, that we, we 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 partner with state 
the state, we, with government, we partner with uh, private companies in, in all of our operations around the world. It's generally something we find we need to do as creating a, a, a stable investment platform for each jurisdiction. Hey, boy. I would say for us as a company, we're not that affected directly because we have operations in Europe and we don't really part of those trade wars in that sense. But we are, of course, part of supply chains when it comes to all that we need in order to carry out our business, both in mining and in smelting. And, you know, you can something is around trade wars, but there's also been other disruptions in, in terms of logistics. There's been the disruptions in terms of, uh, you know, chips, and there's been disruptions in terms of COVID. And uh, we have been able to operate through these things, but there have been times when it's been tough. And, of course, we've been reminded that uh, even though we feel that we're only operating locally in Europe, lots of our customers feel that they are very safe because they're dealing with somebody who's only operating in Europe. It's near shoring, it's a safe supply, and, and yes, it is. But we are also dependent on, on global supply chains for many other things that we need. I think the thing for us um, became very clear when uh, XM was reauthorized in 2019. Congress act, the U.S. Congress actually gave XM Bank additional mandate uh, to ensure that our exporters could continue to lead, uh, especially in the transformational export areas. And so we created a, and that they asked us to create a program, which was our, which is called our China uh, CTAP, which is called our China Transformational Export Program, of which critical minerals now uh, has become very much a priority uh, for us. And as you had said earlier, um, even with from a bipartisan perspective, having the um, uh, U.S. Congress, uh, in a very bipartisan way, support the work that we're doing and wanting to also see what additional uh, uh, resources that we needed in order to be able to help uh, our exporters who are facing that stiff competition. So we've really seen a great deal of support uh, from um, not only from, from, from the stakeholders uh, that we, um, uh, we work with, but we understand that, you know, uh, an exporter is not going to win on price alone. We can't be in the what they call the race to the bottom. It has to be around value. And it has to be about the fact of does our agency as a government agency have the tools that we need to be able to help our exporters to have a lot more flex flexibility when they come to us seeking the kind of financing that they need. And we want to also then be able to use what we have in partnership and collaboration with private sector to be able to, 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 to support um, our uh, different companies. Thanks. You, you mentioned actually, uh, you mentioned that you wanted to avoid a race to the bottom, and, and I don't think you're referring exactly to this, but one of the things that you and I were discussing before the panel was that you know, regardless of what uh, safeguards you put in, in terms of trying to, whether it's on about sustainability or in terms of, you know, whether trade restrictions rate prices raise or, or create difficulties in terms of supply chains, you're not able to sell your product for any more. At the end of the day, there's a global market, there's a global price. Doesn't matter if you're the worst operator or the best operator, the price is the same. How do you how do you manage that as a company, and how do you manage that when you're trying to again trying to decide what uh, areas you might try might try to finance, but first with the company. Look, it is a challenge. I think commodities are probably different to exporting manufactured goods. So a commodity, you know, 99.9% .9 copper cathode produced by one company is the same as 99.9% .9 copper cathode produced by another company. And so price is, there's no other differentiator in terms of the physical product. Yes, there can be a lot of differentiation of how you've chosen to Produce that product, uh, and the and your 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 be it the emissions, the energy intensity, the ESG component, but the actual physical product is identical. And to date, we generally, for a lot of t despite a lot of talk, there's very little signs in global markets of people paying different prices for the same physical commodity. Now, in manufactured goods, absolutely, quality becomes a differentiator. The and the, the, you can you can differentiate on much more in that space. So in commodities, our experience is we have to deliver improved sustainability in how we produce in order to sustain our uh, our license to operate. 
but it won't necessarily translate into a different price. And therefore, we have to engineer and re-engineer our business constantly to improve how it operates whilst remaining competitive. And it's a, it's a constant tension. Uh, you, you, you build in cost, obviously, as you choose to uh, operate in different ways. Uh, sometimes you can remove costs through sustainability. So if you can reduce your energy consumption, in today's high cost energy world, you may actually reduce your cost of production and improve its sustainability at the same time, but often you're adding cost. But you have to find a way to do it and, and stay competitive. And so sometimes for us, we find that that means we have to bring our ESG approach, but perhaps access lower cost, uh, lower cost engineering or lower cost construction from elsewhere that enables us to remain competitive in how we build our plants. But, but you absolutely have to be sustainable to keep your license to operate, but you also have to be cost competitive in a global market. And for Bolin, because one would assume, or at least my assumption is, operating in Europe, you start at a cost disadvantage. How do you manage that? I mean, this is nothing new. I mean, this is commodity markets. We are total price takers. The chance to differentiate the, uh, the, the price is very low, even though we're trying to get some premium for, for our sustainability profile. It is very difficult. So, yes, we, and, and by the way, this price also moves around all the time. So, that means that you need to be very good at financial planning. You need to make sure that you have a balance sheet that is capable of handling the ups and downs regarding these uh, situations. And, um, and then, of course, you need to make sure that you are very efficient when it comes both to you know, operating cost and capex around how you do things. That, this is nothing new. It's been like this for all, all the time. And you have to make sure that you are more productive than your neighbor. Uh, and that's the way that you make money over time. Uh, so that's why I have to live with. But I think it's, for those who have never been to mining before, some people kind of look at our balance sheet and say, well, you have almost no debt. You know, you're, you're, you're sitting cash rich. And I usually say that, yes, that's true. But remember, we get into Lehman crash, crashes and we get into all kinds of things you know, every 10 years or so, and we need to make sure that we have a balance sheet strong enough to survive those situations as well. Uh, and of course, but that, this is absolutely nothing new, but it makes us very different from other companies. And the Exxon Bank, in terms of avoiding, again, as you pointed out, you know, the, you, you need to avoid that, that race to the bottom. But again, does it mean that you are selecting specific projects based on the actual sort of quality of, of the project itself or what were quite what a absolutely absolutely I mean the, the way that we work is that you know you need to have an idea in geology where you want to go and then you you know get some idea about what the kind of potential project will look like and what the geology looks like but very quickly you have to build a model how much would it cost to to uh, you know, invest and to be able to build this mine. What would the operating cost be while you're operating it? What would it look like? And uh, what would that does the total economics look like? And not to forget the closing cost, which is not insignificant in a mine, needs to be in the calculation from the beginning. And we will only pursue the products that look good from a financial point of view. Uh, sustainability will also be part of these discussions early, even though I think that's actually from our point of view maybe not such a big differentiator. But if there is some some project that would have some kind of environmental issue that would be difficult to handle, that one was, of course, be more of disqualifying. But I think otherwise, yes, that's the whole thing that you work with mining. You need to find all the products, and then you need to be very smart about assessing what is the total economy is going to be for the next 50 years or a whole cycle before you decide to invest. Because once you decided to invest those three, four, five, six billion dollars or euros, there is no turning back. One of the things, from XM's perspective, we can't pick winners and losers. I mean, we're totally prohibited from, from, from that. Everything at XM really begins with an application. It begins with those uh, individuals who are looking and seeking XM financing, and they range uh, across, uh, across the board. Um, what that selection, I think, that you were, or maybe I was uh, mentioning, was in the mineral security partnerships where the countries, the 14 countries have come together, um, there is now a list of projects that um, uh, have been reviewed um, by uh, those governments that are a part of this process that they believe is bankable. And they're looking across the board at who is going to be the ones that's going to be financing these projects or who want to have the opportunity to finance those. 
Um, if those individuals uh, on those lists come to XM, we're going to look at each and every one of them that's being, being brought to us. But we're not out there picking, you know, one winner over a loser or, or one who might not be as, as maybe more challenging. The thing for us is that we have to, we are broad and we're open uh, for looking at all sectors and in the ecosystem of, of the critical minerals. And so when, when Congress um, authorized us, they gave us a lending cap of about $135 billion. We have spent now about, uh, we've authorized now about 35 of that, and we have another $100 billion left. Um, so we're being very aggressive now uh, in this space because we all saw uh, over these last several years uh, where uh, with all of the different, whether it was COVID, whether it was, uh, whether it was what happened with geopolitical events, whether it was happening in our supply chain, we know that to make this transition, we need all of these minerals. And right now, we, uh, we, we realize that coming together as economies, it, economies is going to be what's going to help us move quicker, faster. Because as he said, these things take a very, very long time. They're very complicated uh, deals, very complicated transactions. And uh, if, they, if they are, are interested in um, being supported by government, um, we want to be able to be there for them. And so we're actively seeking and looking at projects all the time. I do feel there, there is, in recent years, with this focus on critical minerals, there's a lot of new participants in financing mining that haven't traditionally. We see uh, our end user customers wanting to get in, uh, government agencies such as yourself. Uh, there is a risk. There's a lot of people participating now who are not familiar with, with mining, and you do need to pick winners and you do need to pick losers because we do run a risk with such a strong market response is happening now, we run a risk of putting in production projects that shouldn't have been brought into production that are inferior. And these are decade, multi-decade assets that need to be competitive for 30, 40, 50 years, whatever their resource life is. And you know, the investors in, in these assets need to be confident that uh, the asset is going to be able to remain competitive. And so you know, M Michael spoke about the amount of work we do as an industry to really test the robustness of the business case of the projects we bring forward. I, I do feel the investors seeking to intervene and secure supplies do need to be careful because it is very easy to suddenly discover five years from now the, 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 the supply demand balance has been re-established, re, re volumes have been brought in, the market re-establishes itself in, term, in terms of pricing and suddenly if, 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 if marginal projects have been backed that were brought in too soon, they, they will then become enormously value destructive. I mean, I think from, from our perspective, we would look at it to say we're looking for the bankable project. So if that's going to be the winner, we're looking for that. We are looking, we are using all of the skills that we have internally from our professionals, whether it's technical, whether it's legal, whether it's those that are the engineering and the environmental types, um, financial, to analyze each and every one of these projects. And with that, that then, and if they are uh, able to uh, have projects that come to our board to be voted on for, um, uh, to be authorized for XM financing, we are confident that those are going to be projects that are going to be, that's going to succeed. And so right now, for us, we're not seeing enough applications. We're not seeing enough projects. Like you said, there's, and I think you talked about this yesterday, about there is a lot of money out there, and there are companies who have been doing exceptionally well, and they're very flush. Uh, but where, where, com where companies may want to go in markets that are considered a lot more risky or where there is new technology that may have to be utilized for these kinds of projects. They, may be, they can look at agencies such as ours for that type of, uh, um, I would say, com look uh, for their financing. And then the other thing that they can also do is it's not just our agency alone. It is also, uh, we've signed uh, numerous co-financing agreements, especially with members of those 13, 14 now economies that are in the Mineral Security Partnership, because we realize too that we can co-finance together. 
that and and when you see the ability for governments that want to come together around these kinds of projects we know that these are going to be projects that we look to see to be very successful can I ask one quick question? You mentioned the hundred mil hundred billion dollars you had left in lending authority. That's just for critical minerals, or that's the overall Exxon Banks? That's the uh, overall Exxon okay. Banks. I was going to say that sounded, that sounded like a lot of money to me, but I just <laughs> if it did, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people would be wanting that. The the thing that Congress did was they did ask us for four additional mandates. One, like I said, around transformational exports, and then you, everything from semiconductors, AI, quantum computing, and now we've also layered in uh, critical minerals. They asked us to make more finance available for small business, for uh, more uh, financing available in sub-Saharan Africa, and then also in the renewable energy and energy efficiency, energy storage space. So we're uh, open across the board. We only have one prohibition, and that is we do not fund military articles. However, we do dual use. So everything, you know, around police, fire, border protection, things of that nature, we can, we can finance. But at the end of the day, when you start talking about critical minerals, these are very complicated, sometimes can be some very large projects. And what we also like to do um, is to send a signal to the market. So when we find exporters who want to come in and they're looking at a particular area, we have what we can, we can issue uh, a letter of interest. Um, that we have seen signals the market that XM is interested in that financing. Um, those can be issued in anywhere from seven to ten days. We do a, 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 a number of um, uh, areas of due diligence just to talk about uh, where we see the viability of a particular project. We've also uh, been um, uh, successful in working our engineering multiplier program. Those can be projects that uh, if uh, someone wants a direct loan that goes into, it can be folded into the life of the, of the, of the, of the larger loan if um, we, we want to finance that. But those, that kind of program, um, we, re we recently just did uh, with um, a co-financing agreement with Australia and with uh, Korea and the United States coming together around a critical minerals project. Our engineering uh, multiplier program really is, is allow for feasibility studies that can be done, for pre-design, pre-construction, consulting services, and it really is just continuing to bring those particular projects in closer to us so that we can begin to work with them to, so that they can see that XM is interested as well as any other co-financing partners that we might have. Great. Thank you. So well, I did want to, uh, we only have about five minutes left, so I wanted to bring up recycling uh, while I still had a chance. Uh, you know, with the demand for critical minerals, recycling will also become a bigger issue with, you know, expanded use of EVs. You know, there's lots more lithium around and, and, and other minerals. How, can you describe how you see the metals, the two of you, I think, more than the next, metals and mineral recycling going over the next few years and what projects you have on that front? Sure. Look, uh, you're absolutely right. I think this is going to become an increasingly critical aspect of mining. I mean, recycling has existed for many years. You know, steel, aluminium, copper are routinely recycled. Other metals are more difficult to recover and recycle. Um, critical minerals, obviously, we're suddenly going to start building an enormous inventory in our society of nickel and lithium uh, in batteries. Tons and millions of tons of this is going to be driving the streets of, 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 uh, of every city and every 10 or 15 years needing to be recycled. And, and I can actually envisage a world where today we focus on identifying the, the mined inputs of these metals. But in 20 years from now, we'll have an enormous global inventory of this metal driving around needing to be recycled. So we're positioning, at Aramet, we're positioning for that. We, have, uh, we are in the process of uh, uh, developing a, a, a critical mineral recycling uh, capacity. Uh, we've, we've recently inaugurated a, a pilot plant here in France, um, and we are looking to uh, construct a, uh, a, a significant recycling facility for lithium-ion batteries uh, here in front. We've uh, received an EU Innovation Fund grant for that. That goes a long way towards the capital cost. Um, uh, but it is an entirely new world because in traditional mining, you have an ore body that you base your business case on. In recycling, you don't have an ore body. You have to find a way to, to bring together and aggregate these metals for recycling. But it's, I, I, I'm of the view that a mining company 20 years from now, recycling will, tip, will be a significant component of their portfolio, particularly if they're a company focused on processing as well as, uh, as primary mining. Mr. Stavos? 
Yeah, we, we in, in Bullion, of course, are already one of the largest recyclers around, especially of e-scrap and of zinc and others, other metals. So I just, just to put a little bit of a context to recycling, the first one is that there has been a growth for a long time, and many of our metals are in long use. I mean, if you put in copper for a power line or if you put in copper for a substation somewhere, it sits there for 30, 40, 50 years until it comes out. So you have to be aware that you recycle things relatively late. And therefore, yes, it will be good and yes, it will help, uh, but it's not going to be part of solving the, 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 the issue at grant. Eventually, there will be more recycling as this come use, but it will take quite some time. I would say what we're doing, we're doing, as I said, recycling for a long time. Another part of what you can call recycling is actually trying to ex extract more from all waste. And we're doing that. We built a brand new leach plant in one of our uh, copper smelters to be able to handle and take out the last valuable metals before the, the remaining arsenic and mercury and whatever is taken way underground. So that's one thing that we're doing. I'll just one perspective on this just for you to know, and just because everybody says that recycling is always good, and I think recycling might may always be good. But if you take the CO2 perspective, I'll give you two very quick examples. The very easy one is lead. Lead lives for about five years in a, in a, in a lead acid battery. Then it has to be recycled. It's recycled, so it's not that old. Most of the lead that you have in a new lead acid battery is actually recycled lead, even though there's some virgin coming in on the margin all the time. Uh, and the CO2 footprint of a, the recycled lead is much better than the virgin lead, so everybody's happy. Now take zinc. Zinc puts, puts put on your car as rust protection for maybe 20 years. When it comes back, it will be changing its physical properties from being an, used to be a sulfide into being an oxide. That means that when we, we can take zinc from a thousand meters below ground, take it all the way up, concentrate it, smelt it, and have a ton of zinc for about a ton of CO2. To recycle the zinc that's been on a car for 20 years is about four tons of CO2 per ton of zinc. So recycling is not always necessarily CO2 smart. It could be smart for other reasons, but it's not always CO2 smart. This is something that's giving the bureaucrats in Brussels gray hair because they're starting to realize that this is the way it is and, and that if they, you know, it could very easily be so that lots of these potentially recyclable ashes and other things will just be dug down if, if that is what you want, if you want to save CO2 above everything else. That's a, a very interesting uh, point, which I hadn't, I have to be, hadn't thought of, and I guess we'll have to save, unfortunately, for our next panel, which is the question of what should we be recycling and what should we not be recycling, uh, and, and how sustainable is recycling at the end of the day. But unfortunately, we have come to the end of our time on this panel, so I did want to thank all three of you for joining me on this panel, um, and, and make one final point, which is that... Um, the thing that, that one of my big takeaways from this is this concern that you both mentioned, uh, uh, the two of you the, uh, from, from the mining companies at the very beginning, which is that we have, there is a real risk of a sudden turn uh, in the market, and people are worried about the concern about not having enough you know, met minerals and metals right now, and could that change very quickly, uh, suddenly, and very suddenly, unexpectedly. I think that's something that we, we all need to be aware of uh, for the coming years. But thank you again. Thank you very much for your, for your time and for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.